those who face eternity easily forget what a lifetime means, what an ending means. You know it doesn't have to be this way. No, Kunavai, it does. They need me. Welcome, welcome, guys. Ender Dragons Daily 59. It's currently really late at night. Remember what we said about the show being bite sized? Well, today it's going to be. I ended up streaming this morning on very little sleep. Did a really cool guild hall decoration setup that hopefully I'll show you in some of the footage in the background one of these days. I think I'll continue with the Revenant map completion for now. Um, and it's just kind of left me with a billion things to do and it's already past midnight. Fantastic. So let's run on in. I've got a miscellaneous comment and response to do with the enemies of Cantha and just some fun re uh, feedback from you guys. So let's run on in. First, we've got Nerdy Viewer who says, The Oni can do the same thing as the sharks did in the Sandswept Isles. They appear from the shadows and jump at you and dismount you. Actually, yeah, good point. I hadn't really thought about this, but if you look back at POF, this is something that the devs did a lot with the Path of Fire release, but then didn't do much of in the subsequent Living World season. And in the Ice Brood Saga, you know, as we've seen, has been constrained in so many ways. I don't think that they've had uh, much opportunity to play around with uh, this either. But in Path of Fire's release, they actually had a lot of mechanisms that would dismount and sort of mess with you. Like you had the spikes in the ground sometimes and the tar traps from the Awakened and... As you're saying here in the subsequent season in the, the Sandswept Isles, as you're skimmering along out in the water, a shark might jump out and instantly dismount you. So we've already seen this like war corp. I, I talked about the war claw in World vs. World. That just shows how much time I've been spending in there recently, I guess. Uh, that we've already seen they've had these interactions. And I think seeing those again in the X-Pack would be a really good counterbalance to the strength of mounts as well. Maybe we find that the Amphar have set up a lot of ambushes in similar ways to how the Awakened maybe did. Perhaps we find that they do the Ice Brood Saga method of sometimes just saying, you know, the mount can't work here. I'm especially thinking right now of the sharp coral mechanic. So in Guild Wars 1, you know, it was a more strategy-oriented, positional-oriented game, and quite often the ground would be hazardous. Maybe you'd be in poisonous swamp water, and it really mattered that you were in poisonous swamp water. That actually affected the combat a lot. If you tried to fight in lava, it would be very, very, very dangerous. That actually does happen in Guild Wars 2 as well. Think about, like, the Mega De Destroyer instance. If you try and fight on the lava, you're obviously going to be in trouble. Guild Wars 2 does it kind of rarely. In the first game, though, you also had when Cantha released this idea of stone spores in the Echovald Forest. So this was the idea of like, and I never appreciated this from a world building standpoint when I was younger, I think, but the idea that there are these magically altered petrified mushrooms out in the Echovald Forest. And when they spore, you kind of inhale it and, you know, that has some kind of detrimental effect to you. But they're like stone spots. I think that's a really fascinating idea. I can't really remember the combat effect that that had. Did it diminish your energy? Did it increase interrupts or something? But they had that in the Echovald Forest. Maybe that somehow impacts your mounts, maybe. But even better, over in the Jade Sea, some areas of the, uh, the Jade had very, very sharp, jagged jade coral and as you walked through it it would just pulse damage on you it wasn't really a degenerative effect like lava would be with the burning or the poisonous swamps would be with the poison but it was like it would chunk your health down over and over areas like this that now you want to move around with your mount i think that works and even if they kind of render it in the right way and sort of show it in the right way that could impair the skimmer too i've been wondering about the skimmer on the jade sea as well like the devs were really good at making it so that the skimmer gets the speed boost on a lot of different kinds of bodies of water. And they, especially one of my favorite things about the patch where they actually added mounts back to Corteria is they might not have been very good with the mount boundaries and you can break loads of jumping puzzles and stuff like that. But at least when it comes to the skimmer, you know, if you're near water, even if it's very shallow, the skimmer is picking up on it. It's it's kind of a real pleasure. You were seeing it actually in some of the footage here at Caledon. But you know, going back to Dry Top and all of those old, uh, you know, um, quicksand areas work just the same. So, they could do this with Cantha. It's not even just about enemies. There's lots of ways that they can interact with the mounts and create a little bit more parity between us veterans who have got a ton of this stuff and the people uh, who, are, who will just be coming in, who I think should be a priority. There is still one big question, and that's the sky scale, because none of these interactions I've talked about here really deal with that. But maybe the Canthans in the Dragon Empire have had their fair share of fighting against dragons and airborne creatures and, you know, they have black arrows and whatever and they know how to pull sky scales out from the sky. I could see it. Next we have Jason the Severe 
who says, what about the envoys? Or the other envoys? What have they all been doing this time? Could be an interesting story arc to think that since Shiro's destruction, they may have had a more involved role in Canthus. Side note, bring back the Kappa. The envoys are really weird because the devs did start talking about them a bit in a weird way through the collections in the Spirit Veil. Now, if you remember the idea of the Spirit Veil, at least the start, or, sorry, the Forsaken Thicket, the very start with the Spirit Veil wing really had a lot to do with, you know, lost spirits. And there was kind of that idea of the River Styx and Gorsevold the Multifarious is dragging all these spirits together. So having like Envoy lore kind of made sense. And I really thought they might do something good with it. But then they never really did. And then the Forsaken Thicket ended up not really being about lost souls at all to a certain degree. It became more just about the Massar and about Zira. And I don't know whether the devs kind of had an idea, like, back in Guild Wars 1, because then obviously that became the Bloodstone story. And I'm wondering if in Guild Wars 1 they had the idea of the Lich was using the Bloodstone to capture souls into soul batteries. Maybe the devs had ideas right when the start of the Forsaken Thicket came out to do stuff with the Envoys and do stuff with soul batteries and stuff like that. And then ended up kind of course correcting, so we never saw it. And now there's the question, well, we're going to Canther, will they do it as well? And it's just... It's, it's really rough because there's so much that I want End of Dragons to cover. I don't want another library scene that is overly waffly on details. Like, I don't want a moment where a bunch of envoys come to us and... And explain a bunch of stuff, but it doesn't really make much sense. In a weird way, when we died and came back to life, that was a good opportunity to talk about the envoys again. And in a way... Uh, when we went to the Hall of Chains and the idea that Desmina now rules over there was a good opportunity to talk about the Envoys and exactly how they fit in with the rest of this lore because even back in Guild Wars 1, the Envoys were so Canther specific and we never saw much about them when it came to any of the other God lore and, and Death lore and stuff like that. So why are they so Canther specific? Maybe the devs can talk about. I would probably shunt this off to the Living World season following, honestly. They're cool creatures with interesting designs. We've seen some of their weapons get on the gem store, but sh shove them off for now and see what you want to do with them later. Deal with the end of dragons first. A little point of the video production from Shark. Lo-fi background music's a new thing for you. It works pretty well. The voiceover, I like it. Yeah, I really love the Dust Force music, which I've been using a lot. Like, the past 20 episodes of the Dust Force stuff. I originally just put it on as a nostalgia bomb, but I kind of, I thought it worked. Um, and so if you guys are over on my discord on the spud discords I've created a new channel there called WP video help where I specifically ask for advice from you guys And I asked for advice about background music just like last week and some of you guys posted suggestions A lot of it was like with vocals and stuff and I don't really think worked I'd rather it be video game music and I'd rather it be obscure video game music so I'm still looking. If anyone wants to help, please feel free to go over there. But somebody did recommend like a lo-fi, like royalty-free lo-fi thing. I thought I'd throw it in. And uh, we'll see We'll see how it goes. As always, with all these videos, I'm constantly messing with little things. And I'm not talking about it in the commentary because I want to see if you guys notice. And then if there's a positive comment, I know it's real. It's not just that I prompted it out of you. It's, it's a real improvement, you know. So there is stuff happening. And uh, yeah, if you guys want to contribute, especially with audio... Uh, head over to the Discord. I would really love that. And I'm thinking of using that channel for help with other stuff as well. I might do a pinned comment of just like, here's big ways you can help me. Like getting access to a Chinese Guild Wars 2 account again after I lost mine with the whole Kill Ping story. Uh, and stuff like that, you know. Th there are ways in which we can improve and you guys might be able to help out. Anyway, next we've got Steve who says, uh, Hey WP, do you think there'll be a new combat mechanic introduced for End of Dragons? And what do you think it would be? Path of Fire introduced Barrier to the game, which is basically an overshield mechanic. Heart of Thorns introduced some technological changes as well as things like expanding AoE field. What do you think we'll see for Ender Dragons? I personally like the idea of a disarm mechanic. I used to play WoW years ago and there were ways to temporarily disarm an opponent, assuming they had a weapon, which I had a lot of fun with. The problems I see with it Guild Wars is that everyone would have to have a set of unarmed skills to use in that time and the disarm would have to affect the other weapon set so they don't just pull out the other weapon. I do however like the idea of everyone using those unarmed skills and the possible ways fist weapons could work with to augment them. Maybe the unarmed skills would purposefully be weaker but offer some form of utility and damage for you to use until you get your weapon back. Or in instead a full set of skills you may just get a generic skill or two when we have to punch our way out of ice like if we get frozen. Alternatively if it does not affect the second weapon set for the class that can swap forcing your opponent to swap weapons and would be useful to help turn a fight. So I think there's space for this mechanic. I think there always has been, even since launch. People were talking about the idea of an unarmed weapon set for all the professions. In a weird way, I do want to note that Guild Wars kind of already has that. And that's the downstate. Like, when you are downstate, you are disarmed. That's kind of 
the way that they're doing it there. And think about it. What does a warrior do when he's downstate? Does he continue swinging his axe while he's on his back? No, he throws rocks and he pulls out a little hammer that he throws and, and the engineer grabs whatever gadgets he can use. You're kind of already disarmed there. And I think the w if they were going to go further and do like a standing disarmed concept, we would see it be a bit like the downstate where you have limited skills that are profession specific. And they could have fun with that. I can even very clearly imagine like another little section in the UI that says disarm skills down there. And you know how all the, the uh, downstate skills are kind of color graded red. Maybe these ones have got their own grading yellow or something like that, you know. Uh, so I can see it. Do I think it's a high priority though? I actually don't really. I, I would rather they really go gung-ho on the elite specs and doing fancy and ambitious things with the new elite specs such as entirely new weapons such as bringing underwater weapons to above land and you know messing with what can be made in offhand all that kind of stuff i think should should go further there's also just another thing i'm not too excited about with this and that's just does guild wars 2 really need another form of cc we've got knockdowns and launches and floats and sinks and all this stuff right and stuns and dazes now we're adding disarm to the pool. It just kind of bloats, you know, to a certain degree. I think that as far as CC and incapacitation mechanics, the game has all the bases covered to create really rich strategy and combat experiences. It's just how the balance ends up landing and, and how creative the devs are. So again, not a high priority, but I think you've got a fun idea. And, and, and one that many people have had over the years. And lastly, as I say, bite-sized, I did warn you guys, uh, Tech Striker says, Can anyone clarify, as I'm only going off the wiki, I can't find the lore video on the deep that WP mentioned. Oh, it should be there. Uh, WP keeps mentioning the mist with the Oni, but the wiki says, Guild Wars 1 Oni were only linked with Canucksite in the deep. And that Canucksite itself has no link to the mists. Anyone have any sources to cover either theory? Well, this is one of those examples where the wiki has a note on the page that I disagree with. The wiki for Canaxi does say, unlike other demons, Canaxi has no known association with the mists. Somebody wrote that there. Now, here's my stance. It is explained that in the lore, demons are from the mists. If Canaxi is a demon, therefore, Canaxi has a mist connection. And as you play the actual content, now it, this is not substantiated in the, uh, the physical text, right? But as you play the content, and as you go through the jade, and as you enter what Canarxi calls the Nightmare Realm, right? A whole other realm that's underneath the jade there. To me, that is all very mist-oriented, and he is a demon in the game's code, and as far as the mechanics are concerned. So therefore, I have been saying Canarxi is misrelated. If Canarxi is misrelated, his allies and the things he's got with him are likely to be as well. That is to say, all those shadowy demon shade creatures he's got with him, as well as the Oni, share this connection. But it doesn't necessarily mean, especially with the Oni, you could just say they're shadow stepping. Shadow stepping is not necessarily mist travel. I seem to remember an old interview in which a dev talked about this, but I can't remember what side of the coin they fell on. And it would be a very old interview. I did do a little bit of digging before this video to try and find it. I even read my faction's manual to see how they describe shadow stepping if, if there's some kind of mist traversal going on there. And there's really not. So yes, as far as the actual text is concerned, Canarxi could just be a Tyrian native thing that is created this illusory realm, the nightmare realm below the jade. And he's a demon, but he was always here. But again, that contradicts demon lore. I, I feel like this is just someone doesn't like the idea that Canuxi is from the mists, even though he's from a demon. So they put that note on there and it, it could be worded a bit different, but whatever. I don't want to be too picky because as always, the wiki is an amazing resource and usually does very, very, very well. But I think it creates this little bit of confusion. Maybe I need to augment the way I discuss this uh, going forwards, but that's basically the situation there. And again, I don't really know where the end of dragons will make him a priority in his story maybe something about one meta maybe something for a raid after everything's out similar to how we eventually got the city of adashim but as a raid format so there you have it guys that's end of dragons daily for today thank you very much for watching i hope you enjoyed a little bit of the background footage i'll leave you with this cool little bit of art somebody dropped over on the subreddit subreddit's usually fairly inactive but lately there's been a bit more discussion there was actually a really cool thread about the idea of whether guild wars 2 can be considered like uh, a contrarian game to the rest of the MMO world uh, that I really love. So those of you guys who have been active over there, amazing stuff. There is a link to that in the description as well. I keep shilling the Discord, but there's one down there as well. So if you guys want to see some of this stuff, feel free. And thank you to the person who made this elite specialization concept art you can see here. And yeah, I'll be back tomorrow with hopefully something a little bit meatier. Thanks guys for watching, especially, especially to the people who came to the long stream, the decoration stream. And uh, I hope you guys have a great evening. I'll see you next time.